I'm downright excited about it. One o'clock came fast. I'm ex I'm downright I excited know. about it. One o'clock came fast. I don't know.
afternoon. Councilmember Dustin Hillis, Chair of the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Councilmember Dustin Hillis, Chair of the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee. Joined by my colleagues to my left. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Marcy Collier Overstreet, to my right, my colleagues to my left, and joining us remotely is Councilmember Mary Norwood, to my right, Councilmember Andrea Boone, and joining us remotely is Councilmember Mary Norwood. Um, since Councilmember Norwood is uh, not with us and is virtual, she does not count as a quorum, so we're going to wait until we are joined by Councilmember Waits to do any voting matters. However, we are going to go ahead and start um, with our public comment and then move to presentations. <clears throat> First up, we have Elisa Gambino. How is it working? Okay. So um, I'm sorry, Mary Wood Norwood is not here again. I hope she's not ill, but I hope you're watching Mary in that camera because I'm in your district. Um, I'm a 22 year resident in District 8. I'm a documentary filmmaker and a board member of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. I represent a group of Buckhead residents who share Mary Norwood's concerns about public safety, but we have a different idea about what public safety means for our city. We believe that spending $16 million a year on a near empty jail is not a pathway to safety. Um, I attended a meeting with Ms. Norwood in my neighborhood um, where she said, and this is a quote, we only want quality people in Buckhead. This gave me pause because the role of leadership is not to keep people out, not to judge them as quality or not, but rather to create a city where everyone can have a quality of life. The role of government is to create institutions that affirm and create that possibility for every single one of us. Leasing, our AC, leasing the ACDC to Fulton County does nothing to create quality institutions or quality of life for all of our residents. Fulton County's DA Willis and Sheriff Lobot must get serious about decreasing the jail population in Fulton County so that the city of Atlanta does not make money from incarcerating people from Fulton County. It is morally corrupt to enter into a business agreement with Fulton County in order to make money off of incarcerating people when that space could be used to assist people in our city to improve their quality of life. Fulton County should decrease their jail population much like the city of Atlanta has decreased ours. They must look for long-term solutions to decreasing their population and not decreasing their jail population and not short-term fixes especially when those short-term fixes deny Atlanta the possibility of having a center that would expand our ability to address the needs of our residents, a center that would provide services for people who are without secure housing, employment, and without mental health services. I kindly ask that the City Council act on their 2019 promise to reimagine the ACDC. Please don't go back on your promise and please pass the proposed legislation. Thank you. Next is Cynthia Strand. Hi, good morning and thank you for having me this morning. Um, I've lived in Atlanta off and on since 1981 and I keep coming home to Atlanta. So this morning I walked around the um, Atlanta City Detention Center and for anyone that is listening and doesn't know, it's located at 254 Peachtree Street Southwest. From here at City Hall, it's a three minute drive and a nine minute walk down Trinity and then turn left on Peachtree Street Southwest. From our beautiful capital, it is a four minute drive. From our fabulous soccer stadium, it's a four minute drive also. When you stand outside, you think about what it can be when you address a problem and incarceration is not the answer. It can be a model for every city in America that faces challenges that are similar. Housing and homelessness, justice reform, employment and financial empowerment, health care, and importantly, mental health care. 
Atlanta is a big, bold, noisy city, and we need to make noise about this forward-looking plan that will benefit our community. Our city does not need to make money on incarceration and should not shoulder Fulton County's management problems. Go look, walk around, get off on the Garnett Marta stop if you want to take Marta. Look around, there is nothing to fear down there. As of this morning, there were 56 detainees in the center, just 56 at a cost that could be so much better used. And again, show Atlanta is a forward looking city that is willing to take care of all of its citizens. Thank you very much. Heather O'Neill. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Heather O'Neill. I am also in Mary Norwood's district. Um, as a 12-year resident of Buckhead and, Fulton, and a Fulton County taxpayer, I would like to see Atlanta move in a more just and progressive direction and transform ACDC into a center that supports and nurtures and provides valuable services to the Atlanta community. Um, our taxes have doubled in the past three years. and. The increase has largely gone to APS, which we are certainly happy to support. But as a taxpayer, I cannot support ACDC in its current state. It is immoral, it is unjust, and it's $60 million a year, as you just heard, Cindy said there's roughly 50 people, 56 there today. That is a waste of tax dollars, that's a waste of my tax dollars. Transform ACDC into a vital and needed community center that supports the city and people who live here. Thank you. Misty Kelly. My name is Misty Kelly. I also live in Mary Norwood's district. And as you see, I'm holding a sign that I will show to everyone that has touched my heart. It says, too many of us still believe our differences define us. Guess what? Everyone who's homeless is no different than me. I am one step away, and so is so are you, one step away from being homeless. You're one event away from being homeless, one event away from suffering trauma and having mental disturbance, something that would make you feel or do things that you wouldn't normally do. ACDC is meant to serve people and punish them for something that they may or may not have had happened to them on purpose. I feel that this center can be repurposed and be used to prevent to, to serve preventative measures and to maybe be a community center or something that provides resources that would help people before getting to that step. If we want to feel like we want to criminalize people who are homeless, then that means that we think we're better than everyone else, right? That's not fair. No one's better than me. I'm no better than the person who's living steps away from my household and the person who's been through something. I am one step away. Mary Norwood, you are one step away and one event away from being in the same place as the people that we're criminalizing. Let's find a way to make it better. Let's find a way to make all Atlantans feel that they are at home, regardless of whether they have a roof over their head or not. Anne Werkheiser. My name is Ann Werkheiser. I'm a resident of Atlanta, and I'm here in support of closing the jail and opening a center for wellness. I'm a mental health provider. I spent two years working with individuals who had been criminalized and incarcerated for their mental illness. And you would think that working in that system would have taught me a lot, and it did, but it left me with a lot more questions than answers. Questions like, how can we expect people to grow while restricting them to a tiny cage? How can we expect people to find new and non-criminal ways to get their needs met when we launch them into a system and label them in ways that makes it harder and harder for them to do so? How can we expect people to move through a crisis moment when we respond to their crisis moments by locking them up and literally tying them down? How can we expect people to heal without comfort, without support from their family, their friends, their community, without access to good sleep, without comforting and nourishing food, without competence? In healthcare, without time in nature, without autonomy, without freedom, without, without, without. 
So with all these questions, what I leave you with now is why would you suggest that we continue to harm where we could help, continue to take where we could give, continue to break down where we could build up? Why not close this jail and open a center where we can address the root causes of crime with health care, with mental health services, with housing, with support? Why would you propose selling the jail to Fulton County so that they can expand their problem rather than actually addressing the problem by decarcerating and offering support. Close the jail, do not sell it or lease it to Fulton County, offer support, address the problem, and show us that you care about us and care about your neighbors. Thank you. Emily Backus. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Backus. I'm a teacher in Atlanta Public Schools. I appreciate those tax increases to fund us. Shout out. <laughs> I'm here today uh, with everyone behind me to speak in support of Councilmember Waite's resolution to repurpose the jail as the John Lewis Center for Health and Wellness. I noticed across the way a series of portraits of civil rights leaders that you see every day when you come to work here brave Americans who challenged the status quo to stand for justice and who were often arrested and jailed for that work. You ran for city council because you love this city and you love the people in it. You want to leave a legacy of how you served Atlanta and made it better. Is spending $16 million a year to put poor people in cages the legacy you want to leave? Or would you rather set an example for the rest of the country of what a southern city can do to provide life-changing care and services for your citizens. I was so proud recently of the Atlanta City Council's move to protect abortion rights. It is an amazing feeling to be able to talk to people who live in New York or California about what we are doing here. I would love to continue those conversations to brag about the leadership that you can show. Do you want to be remembered as the council who enabled Fulton County's abuses or as the leaders who made a brave decision to challenge oppressive systems and honor the history of liberation work in this city? Thank you for your time. Katie Murphy. Hi, my name is Katie Murphy, and I'm from Atlanta District 5, and now attend Georgia State right next door. Um, today I'm struck by how many community members are here to speak against this jail, and alternatively, how few city council members have done the same in showing up. I too am here to echo their calls to close ACDC. I'm a mental health care provider, and closing this jail is directly in line with our priorities as mental health professionals and advocates. We know that mental health issues become more severe when individuals come in contact with the carceral system. Jails simply are not adequately equipped with the services or personnel needed to treat mental health issues, nor should this be a default treatment in this city. Jails are not places of healing. The research supports this, and you all know this. Mental health services should be provided by individuals specialized in this treatment in healthcare settings where it should happen and not while someone is in a cage. The amount of money that would be funneled to this jail is simply immoral. This could be so much better spent on services that are proven to actually improve individuals' quality of life, like access to affordable and effective mental health care services. Specifically today, we're asking that you zero out the budget for the jail and instead fund the John Lewis Center for Health and Wellness. Imagine what this city could be if instead of spending $16 million on incarcerating vulnerable individuals, that money was spent in providing their essential supportive health and mental wellness. For $16 million, you could pay for over 200 full-time mental health care providers who could be servicing hundreds to thousands of individuals. What could this city be if instead of having folks locked up in a cage during a crisis, we instead kept them warm, gave them a home, gave them the health care they needed? For these reasons and those mentioned by all of those before me and after me, um, I ask that you all please work to close this jail. Yvonne Plotter. Good afternoon. Dear councilmen and women, 
56 people, $16 million. That is a quarter of a, mil of a, a million dollars per prisoner. But this is not a business case. My name is Yvonne Plotter, and I have grown up in the outskirts of Atlanta and studied at Georgia Tech. I'm here today to support the legislation introduced by Councilwoman Waits to repurpose the detention center. I heard a story of a woman who could not access the mental health services she needed. This was in Atlanta. She breaks windows of corporate buildings in order to go and receive those mental health services at a prison. This should not be the case. I urge you, councilmen and women, and thank you to the three who are here in person today, to repurpose the ACDC and give this woman and many others the help they deserve in a dignified manner. Thank you. Lily Ponitz. Hello, my name is Lily Ponitz and I go to Georgia State and work in downtown Atlanta. I'm here to call on this committee to support the resolution introduced by Keisha Waits and do right by the formal, former council members, the former mayor, all the organizers, and our incarcerated and formerly incarcerated community members, and finally close ACDC and repurpose it into the John Lewis Center for Health and Wellness. Imagine the good that $16 million per year could do for residents of, the, of Atlanta. And imagine the harm that would be done by loaning this jail to Fulton County, a government that has already shown themselves to be incapable of providing people with a dignified or even safe time in jail. As the cost of living continues to rise in Metro Atlanta, we should be investing in services that resource those who are experiencing or close to experiencing homelessness and those who are re-entering their communities. Please create the John Lewis Center for Health and Wellness and invest in transformative change and leadership that prioritizes people in this city. Nisha Gupta. Hello, my name is Dr. Nisha Gupta. I'm a psychology professor and a clinical psychologist who serves residents in Atlanta. I'm here to request that you support the legislation calling for the repurposing of the Atlanta City Detention Center into a center for health and wellness which could offer much needed therapeutic resources for our fellow community members. Many detainees of this center are held on low level offenses caused by struggles with addiction and mental health, struggles which could be much better remedied by funding mental health services rather than incarceration. Spending time behind bars does little to support those with substance use or mental health challenges. It only provides a time out before releasing them without any new coping tools, which predicates people to return to their old ways of life. Incarceration pales in comparison to a dedicated wellness center, which could equip individuals with the tools necessary to live life without relying on drugs and alcohol or behaving harmfully due to mental health challenges and symptoms of trauma. Jail and prison systems cannot possibly offer the same level of support and effectiveness in producing long-lasting healing and behavioral change that a wellness center could offer. Therefore, I implore you to consider the best use of state funding for our fellow Atlantans. Do we want to criminalize those who suffer and make mistakes? Or do we want to offer therapeutic services that can promote long-lasting psychological transformation and positive health outcomes to improve the well-being of our entire community? Thank you. Micah Herskind. Hello, I'm Micah Herskind with the Southern Center for Human Rights. I think as you all know, um, I have to say, I'm tired of being here and you're probably tired of seeing me. I'm tired of seeing me here. Um, but I'm here because I think it's really important um, first to note that, you know, I think over the past three or so months, you've seen all of these people and so many more, so many different variations of people almost every week calling on you to close the jail. Um, and I think it sends a really negative message um, when those cries and those calls for change go unheeded um, by our council. 
I know that it's not just you three who are here today, and I'm grateful that you all are here today. Um, but it really, it really is um, a little bit disillusioning to me when we have, you know, such a clear community call over and over and over and over again from so many people. You know, we we put out calls to action for folks to, you know, to show up, um, and you know, we let them know that there's a meeting happening, and people are always so excited to come out. You see, I mean, every week during a workday when people have jobs, they're here, um, and I think that that's really amazing, um, and it shows how dedicated people are to this issue. Um, and it also means that with each week that, you know, we don't see progress on this, um, that it gets a little bit more scary each time that, you know, we can see a community call go so unheeded. So I hope that you three will, you know, take this to heart and really take some action. Um, I want to quickly talk about Fulton County specifically. I know that there's always various, you know, things going on behind the scenes. Does, it, does Fulton County need ACDC? Does it not? Um, the one thing, you know, you all know where I stand on it. What I just want to stress to you as you're likely being approached in these conversations is just your first question always should be where is the data? Who exactly is in Fulton County? We've been going through the data of who's in Fulton County and we're seeing charge after charge. A lot of people who could have been taken to ACDC where we know only the low level offenses go. We know that there are so many people, hundreds in Fulton County who could easily be decarcerated, who could easily be released um, and even better provided with resources on their way out. So any time that you are approached about you know, a, a Fulton County deal, please just make your first question. I want to see all the data of exactly who is in the jail. It's preposterous for us to even consider giving away this massive asset, this massive resource that the city owns to Fulton County without even having that data there. Um, I hope that that feels like a reasonable middle ground for you all, at least just to say, you know, we want to know what we're, what we're looking at and what we're looking into. Um, and so that's just what I want to leave you with. Please, please, please demand the data. When we file open records requests, it takes them months and months and months. It's, you know, we know it's different for you all. And so please just demand that data. Recognize that Fulton County Jail can easily be decarcerated. It could happen within the next couple weeks and that's the action that they really need to take. Thanks so much. Devin Franklin. Good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Devin Franklin. I also work uh, alongside Micah with the Southern Center for Human Rights. Um, as I've told you all before, I am a former public defender. Um, and it is really difficult for me not to get up here at this podium every week and wax poetic um, about the stories behind some of the numbers and stories and narratives that we hear um, on our news. Um, I have only been with the organization about four months, uh, so I'm not quite as tired as Micah of coming up here and talking to you all. I still got a lot to say. Um, <laughs> but I will say that I do echo his concerns and sentiments to the extent that it is a bit deflating um, when you have call from the community seemingly not being heard in the manner um, in which we hope they hope them to be heard, um, and I try to write things, but my, my heart gets in the way, and I come to you all, and I just continue to speak from my heart and try to figure out a different way for you to see and understand the importance of doing something different. Um, I think what we hear is a lot of stories looking to build upon hope an imagination about what our city could be. Um, and from my perspective, I don't ever think that hope or imagination should be controversial. Um, when we have invested in ways that have continued to fail us, I think open minds and open hearts um, in terms of doing things in a different way um, should be of the utmost importance to those who have the authority and power to do so. Um, and so uh, speaking with Micah today, I was like, Dev, what are you going to say when you're going to get up there? I said, I want to be hopeful today. <laughs> um, I want to talk about what the, the potential day-to-day -day at a John Lewis Health and Wellness Center would look like. I think about the numerous homeless clients that I've represented in my previous 12 years in courts, in felony court. Um, I think about my walks from my office to the courthouse and the several homeless people I would see laying on the streets, right? And I have the heart but not the ability at that point in time to do something for them. And I try to think about what if there was a city agency um, that, you know, if you saw people sleeping on benches and the employees come by and check in to see if they need 
a place to sleep or food or water or health care, and then an hour later somebody's able to take them somewhere. What if you are you know, in public and you see someone behaving erratically and putting themselves in harm's way? Imagine texting a number of an unarmed, urgent responder to come and deal with that, right? These are the kinds of things that we can see if we invest in these potential resources. So I know a lot of the things that we say to, to the untrained ears sound like we're attacking the police, um, and it's not what we're trying to do. But we do understand that a large carceral footprint only leads to further incarceration. And what we have seen in the city, that the more and more you incarcerate people, we don't see any results or responses for that. So we ask that you stop throwing good money after bad and invest in things that actually may help somebody. Give it a shot. Shara Conkle. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shira Konkul. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you again and those of you who are on Zoom, perhaps. Um, I'm a licensed professional counselor here in Atlanta. I'm also a lead Atlanta alum um, 2020. I'm a small business owner serving clients in every single one of your districts, um, and I'm a member of the Temple in Midtown. I'm also a parent and a spouse to an emergency room physician. As you might gather from the shirt, <laughs> I am here to urge you to vote yes on Council Member Waite's proposal. As a member of this community, every time I pass ACDC, it is with a very, very heavy heart. So often I look at the Atlanta skyline with such pride. And yet when I look up at the jail, I have the following words come to mind and I actually want to give everybody an opportunity to take 10 seconds, close your eyes if you like. I do this with my clients all the time. Close your eyes and think about what words come to mind to you when you think of ACDC. The words that come to mind for me are depressing, isolating, dismal, traumatizing, claustrophobic, waste of space. You'll notice the word safety has never entered my mind because I'm really clear as someone who spends all of my time thinking about human behavior, that jails looming over me and my family in the middle of my city do not keep me safe. Jails nowhere keep me safe. When I consider how I would feel if y'all were to go ahead and vote for us as a community, not just y'all, but for us as a community to create the John Lewis Center for Health and Wellness, you know, take 10 seconds, think about what that would look like. You look up and you see the John Center, John Lewis Center for Health and Wellness. Hope, community, care, change, redemption, rehabilitation, and yes, safety. I understand it's going to be a lot of work and it might be an unexpected choice for some of the council members to, to choose. But y'all and I both know the status quo every time it's not working, you have the opportunity to change that. We and all of our extended communities who cannot make it out on a Monday afternoon or even a work day, we will be there to support this and all the ways we can in this endeavor. And if not, we promise to be here every time and keep fighting for this until you do. Um, as Evan just mentioned, things like Pat are a great step. Let's continue on that journey together. The other day, my very curious two and a half year old looked at ACDC and said, Mama, what's that? I said, it's a place that people call a jail. It's a cage where we put people who have been hurt. And I hope that when she's a little bit older, I can tell her it's something else. Thank you. Lala Givens. Hi, everyone. My name is Lila Givens. Feeling definitely emotional and inspired hearing the folks that have been sharing. Uh, my mom grew up in Buckhead. Uh, and they moved out in the 70s when schools integrated. And so a lot of the reason why I do some organizing in Buckhead and the reason I'm here today is to try and change my family's kind of legacy with Atlanta and their relationship um, to living in the city. Um, I also work for a uh, nonprofit that supports schools in the Atlanta area. And I'm su in support of the resolution put forward by Keisha Waits. Um, I'm in favor of closing 
the jail um, and turning it into the John Lewis Center for Wellness. And my primary ask today is that this committee continues to listen to Atlanta residents who have shared, not just in this meeting, but in countless meetings over the past several years, um, about what actually keeps our community safe. Um, The effort to close ACDC is a long one. The City Council of Pass has already voted to close this jail, and they've already taken a lot of efforts. There was already a task force, there was bail reform, there's diversion programs started, And so rather than leasing to ACDC, Atlanta should support the county in taking similar action um, countywide. I ask that you do your due diligence to meet with the amazing Atlanta residents, Women on the Rise, Close the Jail, that have been engaged in this work for years. I've been in awe the more I learn about the history of this effort, and I hope that you are too. The safest communities are not the most incarcerated or most policed, they are the most resourced. And the history of this effort to close ACDC is full of imagining what that resourced Atlanta could look like for all of its residents, not just those in Buckhead. Thank you. Ian Demartini. My name is Andy Martini. I moved to Atlanta about a year ago, and I live in District 3. And I chose Atlanta and chose to live in town in the city rather than a suburb because I really believe that Atlanta leads. Atlanta influences everything, and I wanted to be in a progressive place. So I'm here to amplify the voices of women on the rise and communities over cages who've been doing this work for so long. Um, Police and jails do not keep us safe nor do they keep Fulton County safe. Um, I ask that you support um, Councilwoman's Waits resolution and repurpose ACDC into a center for health and wellness where we can actually create public safety with alternatives to um, incarceration, mental health, and housing support. Thank you. Austin Hunter. I'm Austin Hunter, uh, and I'm here to stand in solidarity with everybody else that you've heard from today and multiple times before. We've had this meeting a thousand times, it feels like, at this point. So I'm kind of, again, my guess points of being tired. Uh, you know, why, why are we still doing this? You've already heard a thousand data points. I'm not going to beat you over the head with all of that. We've heard a thousand reasons why we're wasting money by uh, keeping this thing open. Uh, everyone else has already stolen all the good ACDC puns, so I'm not up here to really repeat anything else other than just say, do your jobs. Like, we're, we're constantly told to, to vote for the changes we want to see, uh, and your butts are in those chairs to do that thing. Don't tell us to vote if you're not going to listen to the people. Like, what's, what's the point? Uh, like close this thing let's turn it into a community center uh, Devin talked about hope you guys have the opportunity to give us hope to give our communities hope by actually investing this money in things that would actually uh, bring hope to these communities so please repurpose the jail we move to our next speaker I'd like to recognize we've been joined by council member Keisha Sean Waits welcome next is Ashley Dixon Okay, the next speaker is Devin Barrington Ward. No I have six minutes. Unlike my colleagues, I'm so excited to be here in front of you all today. <laughs> now I'm a little exhausted as well, but um, we appreciate the opportunity to Um, share our perspective, our continued perspective that has not shifted since this process has started all the way back in 2018, but really before all of that, um, when we were making reforms around making sure that we were ending cash bail here in the city of Atlanta, when we were making reforms around decriminalizing cannabis, when we were making reforms around ending the contract with Immigration Custom Enforcement to hold undocumented people at ACDC. And all of these reforms were led by many of the people that are in this room. Um, And so I want to thank you all for you all's continued commitment to show up and be a part of this process. I also want to give thanks um, and and some appreciation to my former opponent um, and the chair of this committee, uh, Councilmember Hillis. Um, He did a very heroic thing last week 
along with our interim chief, where he, on a ride along, was able to help save a man um, that was in the midst of an overdose. Um, and so I think that is a very admirable thing. Thank you for that. Um, with that being said, that is an example of real public safety, right? There was a man that was in crisis because of his addiction, and there were people there, first responders on the scene that were able to intervene. That's the type of Atlanta that we want to see. But we also want to see an Atlanta that prevents a man from even having that type of overdose on the street in the first place. But we can't have that type of Atlanta if we're more committed to prisons and jails than we are committed to treatment centers and drop-in centers for those who are struggling with substance abuse, those who are struggling with mental health, those who are struggling with a lack of services and resources. And so I want to talk about what is real public safety. You know, I live in Bankhead, and I wish there were more people that were able to intervene in a situation like that. There were more members of our community who knew what to do when we see folks on the street, in Bankhead, in Dixie Hills, um, in Collier Heights, in these communities where we see folks on the street having overdoses regularly, where we see folks on the street in crisis, where we see folks on the street without services. That type of intervention is the public safety that we are asking for. That's the public safety that we are demanding. That's the public safety that we deserve. But we also know that everything isn't about public safety. And I also know that this body does think about what does the development, what does the future of the city look like. I'm going to give you an example. Part of the reason why South Downtown looks the way that it does, why there isn't the type of amenities, why there isn't the type of robust community in South Downtown, is because what anchors South Downtown? A jail, right? Nobody wants to come and develop and live next to a jail. Just talk to Memorial Drive. It's part of the reason why Memorial Drive looks the way that it has for the last 20, 30 years, because the first thing that's greeting you from 285 in the heart of De of, of DeKalb County is a 20-story jail. That's not, nobody wants to live next to that. Nobody wants to put a grocery store next to that. No one wants to put a hotel next to that. No one wants to put affordable housing next to that. No one wants to live next to a jail, right? Particularly a jail that doesn't need to be there anymore. It's not as if it's a jail that is holding all of these folks because you all followed our lead with the reforms. It's empty. There's no need for this big facility anymore. And so if we aren't just thinking about it from a public safety perspective, let's also think about it from a redevelopment perspective. What is the best redevelopment strategy for South Downtown? And I don't believe that having a jail anchoring South Downtown is the way to move forward. I also want to go back to mental health. Um, a few weeks ago, someone walked inside of a subway right on Northside Drive and shot someone because they put too much mayonnaise on their sandwich. We are continuing to see and hear, and the police can tell you, about all of these different incidents where it is clear that the motive for this person engaging in this uh, type of activity is not one for financial gain, is not one for um, anything else other than the lack of mental health services that has led them to this place where they are acting and behaving in an erratic manner. Mental health, particularly coming out of the pandemic, it is the silent epidemic that we are not talking about. It is the thing that is putting us most in jeopardy in our city. And so one of the things that we have to recognize is that there is no drop-in free mental health crisis center in the city of Atlanta. That's a shame. Why don't we have that? And no one is able to give me a good answer. And I can guarantee you the police would see much better results in community and we would be preventing more of these crimes if we had this type of drop-in mental health center that is low barrier, that doesn't require, because we live in a state where Medicaid is not expanded. So if you don't have insurance, how are you going to pay for these services, right? And so we can't wait on the dynamics of the state to shift at the state level with the elected officials up there before the city of Atlanta decides to take leadership. No, I don't believe that we should be passing the buck along to Fulton County, even though that is partially their responsibility. We'll deal with Fulton County another day. If you come with us on Wednesday, we're going to take them to task on, on Wednesday morning as well. Isn't that right? Yeah. 
Okay, but today we're asking for you all to step up to the plate, right? And not just wait for another government to do their job. We have a building that is empty. We have a building that is underutilized. And we have a mental health crisis in this city that is boiling over. We have a substance abuse crisis in this city that is boiling over to the point where council members are now having to intervene to save lives, not with just legislation, but with their actual skill. For those of you all who are not like Councilmember Hillis and are not nurses, this is your opportunity to also save lives by moving in a different direction, repurposing this building, naming it after our beloved John Lewis, and let's move forward because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. I introduced Councilmember Waits, but just wanted to state for matters of record that we do now constitute a quorum since we have four present members plus one that is remote. Uh, we have two more speakers. Uh, next is Henri Jordan. And now to the Spirit of God to everyone that's here. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain. Which taketh away the life for the owners thereof, Proverbs 119. Jesus says not to give the glory to James Griff for what God has done in me. Naming those who help him seek to take away my life. James, you ask for death because the word said so. Know ye not that to whom ye yield your service, your say of service to obey. His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Romans 6, chapter 16, verse. They will not be sinless but blameless, free from the power of sin. You shall seek to fight against sin to be servants of Jesus and not Satan or death. Trust not in oppression and, became, and become not vain and robbery. If riches increase, set not so hard upon them, Psalm 62 and 10. The root of all evil means a root or source of all kinds of evil. When you ran for your position, you promoted justice. Then you got a position, they forgot your promise. When they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For whom man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. Second Peter, second chapter, 19 verse. False teachers are further called servants of corruption because despite their profession of salvation, they have become entangled in the world of, in the world and overcome by it. God said he can't back up. God said he can back up what he says. Officer Peak will not cooperate with me to fight against the stalker, which is James Griff, comes in my house, hacks my computer, comes in my roof, corrupt my printer, my locks, my cleaning tools, and steals from me. And this is what y'all uphold. And it's not the will of Christ for me to be treated like this. You should get for justice. This is not to treat a person. And God loves me, and he loves you also. He asks us to treat one another. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That ain't loving me as myself. That's what Christ deserved for me to have or you to have. But whatever you sow, you're going to reap it. When you do evil, you're going to reap evil. You sow evil. But we want Christ righteousness to rule in us. I know I need to rule in me. What about you? Next, and I apologize, I have some trouble making out the last name, but it was the last person to sign up, Theresa, I believe it's Godfrey. Godfrey, a lot of folks that love me, that I do different things for in my business, in my meetings, call me Miss Teresa, and they respect me as such. But there was a time in my life when I did some things I wasn't proud of. And as a result of that, thinking about the lady that just was before me and the things that I made a commitment to do. I came out, I was in North Carolina. I was an employment counselor there. 
and we worked with people who had been incarcerated and we showed them new ways to live their lives and we would have people come up and they had been a drug dealer they walker or something like that in their prime and they never had a resume and they would come up to me and i'd ask well what did you do calm down to Teresa. and what they did was well i sold drugs miss Teresa, or i walked the street miss Teresa." i said oh so you sold drugs well, then that means you have good customer service skills. You know how to count money. You know how to interact with people so they'll come back and buy some more of your stuff. You know, and when they would finish and they would read their resume, they would say, Miss Teresa, they'd be a lot of times crying because they would say, Miss Teresa, I never saw myself like that. I didn't think that I could do something different. You got people laid up in these buildings just like those people. When we come to these rallies, it's not because we don't have something else to do. I like to sign people up to vote. So I put that on hold today because I believe that there's people that can make changes through their votes. And when I was thinking about um, sitting here, I was born in Brooklyn. And as a result of being born in Brooklyn, the Statue of Liberty was there. And the Statue of Liberty, they wanted you to bring your huddled masses, bring people who were looking for a new way to live. They didn't ask these people for a background check. They just let the people come in, and they helped build what we call America. Atlanta is the middle New York, and as a result of it being that way, when I, when I first came here, it was not a lot of building going on. A lot of paperwork was probably getting signed. But now I have a cleaning business, and I'm RBA Cleaning Services. And I do work in residential, commercial, and um, um, construction projects. And when we come in, everywhere you look, there's something different going on. If I was coming into Atlanta, if I was coming in for Google, or one of those big guys, because they even had a little contract up in there on um, 85. When I come in there, and those people, they talk, and they don't came in from L.A., little town in Indiana, you know, somewhere, as they say, bum something, Egypt, you know, but they came to Atlanta because they're looking to put their trade to work. A lot of the people that come to me do not know how to fill out an application. Please go ahead and wrap up your comments. You're 40 seconds over, Ms. Okay. Godfrey. I'm sorry. But what I want to say to you, and Mr. Hill, I watch how you sit. I like to study body language. And when it's like, let me get through with this here. We got to do this for four hours, so let's go ahead and get this over. I just want to hope that you would really think about what it is these are. And one more thing about drug addicts. We're talking about people that's using fentanyl and stuff out here. But in a lot of your homes, a lot of the suburbs, a lot of the um, different big homes that y'all live in, your kids is using drugs. They go in the, they go in the cabinet and they pull the, drug, the, the drugs out. They're in your community, in your churches, but you can buy them insurance. You can put them in rehab two, three, four times. These people here don't even get a chance one time. Thank you for letting me go over and refocus now. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Uh, we're going to skip over the uh, skip around the agenda a little bit. We're going to go back to the adoption of the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Second, Second by Councilmember Overstreet. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Oh. Please vote. Vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. The agenda is adopted.
I will now make a motion to approve our meeting minutes. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Overstreet. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Thank you. That is four yeas and zero nays. Can someone confirm that Councilmember Norwood is still on the line with us as she is not voting? Mr. Chair, she is signed in. We're not sure if she's on the line. Okay, well, given we have four members present, we do still constitute a quorum. Um, being Please count me as yay. Is a yay. Our vote was changed. Councilmember Norwood's votes, which what well, vote was changed? Five yeas and zero nays. The uh, the approval of the prior meeting minutes are approved. At this point, we will look at uh, to be respectful of some appointees. We will go to held items fifteen and sixteen. I am still here. It's not recording my vote. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Norwood. You've been reported on the uh, latest vote. Um, I'm here. Item number 15, the communication from Council Members Liliana Bakhtiari, District 5, Alex Wan, District 6, Howard Shook, District 7, Mary Norwood, District 8, and Matt Westmoreland, Post 2 at Large, appointing Ms. Alexandra Joseph to serve as a member of the Public Safety Compensation Commission. This appointment is for a term of four years. All right, Ms. Joseph. Please come up to the podium and tell us a little bit about yourself and your willingness to serve. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Alex Joseph. I'm interested in serving on the Public Safety Compensation Committee because I believe that law enforcement officers, firefighters, and other public safety officers fulfill essential public safety duties and they deserve to be fully supported. If our public safety personnel are compensated fairly and provided environments in which to work, they will be more effective in their roles and ultimately more likely to remain in the profession. As such, I want to work to ensure that all public safety officers receive fair compensation, reflective of the risk that they undertake to care for our communities. My professional background is well matched for this appointment. I previously served as a state level prosecutor in middle Georgia and as a federal prosecutor. Therefore, I have ample experience working alongside law enforcement officers. Um, thank you again for considering my appointment to the Public Safety Compensation Board, and I am aware that this is a four-year appointment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Joseph. Any questions or comments from committee members? Not. I will make a motion to approve. Is there a okay. second? Second by Councilmember Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. That item is favorable. And Ms. Joseph, and also to our next appointee, so I don't have to repeat it, after or after uh, this committee, we'll go to the uh, Committee on Council. You will not have to reappear. And then we'll go to the full council. You will not have to reappear there. Once it is confirmed by the full council, uh, you will receive communications from our uh, clerk. Thank you. Next is item number 1622C5101. A communication from Patrick Labatt, Fulton County Sheriff, appointing Lieutenant Colonel Curtis Clark to serve as a member of the Public Safety Commission on behalf of the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. Right, Lieutenant Colonel Clark, please come up to the podium. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your willingness to serve on this committee. Commission. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm a, my name is Lieutenant Colonel Curtis Clark. I'm a 33-year member of the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. Uh, I'm a native of Atlanta. Uh, I'm a byproduct of the Atlanta public school system. Um, I've served in pretty much every capacity within the Sheriff's Office through law enforcement, court services, uh, as well as the jail. So I think I'll be a, a good member of this uh, committee. Motion about to approve by Councilmember Overstreet, second by Councilmember Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 
Four yeas, zero nays. The item is favorable, and Councilmember Boone asked to be recognized. Mr. Clark, thank you so much for your willingness to serve just as your mother and father served so diligently in the city of Atlanta. He is a product of the Adamsville community. We are very happy to see you agree to serve in this capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Council Person. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Clark. Now I'll go back to our presentations. Uh, first up is Councilman White, you'd like to say something? Uh, yes, sir. I wanted to speak to my tardiness. Yes, please I go had ahead. the privilege to attend the human trafficking event at the airport today, and so I just wanted to be on the record indicating that we were doing official city business. Thank you. Councilman White, uh, first presentation will be Atlanta Police Department. We have interim Chief Darren Sherbaum to give the department's quarterly update. Chairperson Hentless, Councilmember Boone, Councilmember Overstreet, Councilmember Waits. Uh, good afternoon, members of the staff and our guests that are present. Uh, Interim Chief Darren Sherbaum providing the second quarterly report on behalf of the women and men of the Atlanta Police Department. I want to start. Uh, the first uh, matter I want to bring to your attention actually didn't happen in the second quarter, but I think it's worthy of this body, and that was a successful running of the Peachtree Road Race, which you know is the world's largest 10K. Uh, that does not go easily. That was uh, weeks of preparation uh, with the police department, the Department of Emergency Preparedness, the Atlanta Track Club, and we only have to look to Illinois uh, to see what occurred in that state tragically with their Fourth of July celebration to know why many, many weeks of preparation go into this event. Uh, we have to thank the Fulton County Sheriff's Department, the Georgia State Patrol, Department of Public Works, so many that worked to ensure that we had a, a safe event. And that event goes in early. You saw uh, DPW vehicles along the route, ensuring no vehicle intrusion. You saw our assets in the air and on the ground. And for the citizens, when we asked them to see something, say something, for those that called in suspicious activity, uh, allowed us to quickly to respond to address that. So we really want to thank everyone that allowed us to have a successful Peachtree Road Race this year. Chief Sherbaum, okay. just one second. Are we working to fix this yeah, visual yeah, issue? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Please proceed. It was some enthusiastic runners, uh, uh, Chairperson, that was uh, you're seeing there. And it's not advancing either. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next uh, slide, which which will be us uh, noting the work of the department responding to protect the First Amendment rights uh, around the Roe Ro v. Wade um, decision. Let's go now. have a copy in, in front of you okay All right. we do but I would like yeah. the visitors and the TV watchers to be able to see it as well Not advancing if someone could advance it for me. There we go. And members of the committee, the reason I want to point to this and commend the efforts of the police department on Friday when we came to work, we did not were not aware this would be a decision that would be handed down. And we knew how important this was to many of the constituents uh, in the city. Uh, and that morning, we immediately uh, began our process of reverting to protecting First Amendment functions, to ensuring safe crowd control. And I want to commend the members of the executive staff of the Atlanta Police Department. We had a number of officers that did not go home until after a 12, 15-hour day that day. Uh, we had a number that were, gave up their off days on Saturday and Sunday as we worked to protect uh, the protest. And I think it's important to note uh, the efforts of the department to protect everyone uh, that came out to demonstrate peacefully that weekend. And I think it's speaks to the professionalism of uh, the department, our partners that we have with the Fulton County Sheriff's Department, uh, as well as the citizens of the city who have in their DNA peaceful protest for efforts in, that they care about. I'm going to speak now on crime uh, trends in the city. This is obviously is ending the second quarter. Uh, this chart before you was on the last day of June. I'm going to point to some areas of concern and areas of, of success uh, by the department. 
Uh, in a few moments, I'm going to speak more in detail on homicide, uh, as that is the area that continues to concern us. It is an area that has a number of our strategies being deployed to counter. I do want to note uh, that when we stood before you in the month of April, our homicide rate was trending up at 55 percent over this time last year, and through various efforts and work that, that done, it has been reduced uh, to 20 percent at the time that this report was generated, and it was actually uh, 15 percent this morning uh, when I was working with the, the executive team. Uh, we do see our aggravated assaults trending down for the 28th day. That is encouraging as we're in the summer months. And we traditionally see uh, in the last part of the second quarter and throughout um, much of the third quarter of crime that will rise because of the summer months. And that is encouraging to see uh, the efforts uh, of that area of the 28-day of the reduction. An area of crime that has always concerned this body as, as well as others has been the just a sharp increase of rape reports that we saw at the beginning of this year. Uh, while it was on trend with uh, 20, 2019, uh, prior to COVID, we were seeing a number of delayed reports coming to us uh, requiring the attention of the department. We continue to see those reports shrink. Uh, we've had a 57% reduction in the 28-day, uh, and we continue to see the year-to-date reduce as well. An area that has a significant attention of the department is around robberies, and you'll see that shortly when I go into more detail with homicides. And we continue to see a seven-day, 28-day, and year-to-date reduction um, in a 28-day year-to-date reduction in that area. Uh, that is us focusing on areas where we know individuals may perpetrate these crimes, and focus of the department on crews that may be out in that area. Now, motor vehicle theft that continues to be uh, while down for the year uh, is trending for the 28 day. Uh, that is uh, typical for this time of year when we see uh, vehicles being stolen, particularly around events where individuals leave them running. And I know in my neighborhood and in others where I'm about, it is not com it is very common to see vehicles outside of areas that have great food or have a good reputation for good dry cleaning, and you see individuals out there with their vehicles running. That continues to be well over half of our vehicle thefts in the city are committed while vehicles leave uh, individuals leave their vehicles running. And so we just ask for continued uh, education around that area, just a quick moment to properly park your vehicle, properly secure your vehicle. Uh, we'll ensure it's there when you come back to go about your day. Now, an, an area of theft from motor vehicle, and we know that over the, la the weekend we saw a number of cars broken into in the Zone 4 area uh, as well in Zone 6. Uh, we did see a reduction in the 28 day that is actually atypical for this time of the summer. In a few minutes, I'm going to go into an effort that we have underway to counter uh, car break-ins, but then we're continuing to see uh, the 28 day, hopefully as that, if that decreases, to see the year-to-date uh, decreasing as well. Did a com comparison of crime at the conclusion of the first uh, quarter, as well as those that are uh, reported through the second quarter. Uh, you see what is traditionally occurring around this time uh, in the summer months, but we have seen an 11% reduction in our homicides compared uh, to the first quarter. Um, aggravated assaults, while compared to the first to the second, still continues to, to trend down uh, over the previous months as well as over this time last year. Uh, theft from motor vehicle slightly up, but even though we're seeing a 28-day reduction, uh, as well as the vehicle thefts being slightly up quarter over quarter, but down over this time last year. If I could, uh, Chairperson Hillis, I do want to focus on homicides for about two or three slides because I know it's important to every council member, and I know it's important to the citizens of our city that are listening. If you look here, you can see a first to second quarter comparison of where those homicides are incurring. Uh, the Zone 2 area of the city continues by far to have the lowest number of homicides occurring, uh, with our focus being on Zone 1 and 3 uh, at the first part of the year. Number of resources were placed, at, particularly in the zone one, as we saw that being the highest with open air. You see those reduced uh, by almost half in that area as we, if as we tackle the open air uh, components of that, and we worked in apartment complexes where that was at play. We also saw zone three reduction as we worked in that space, but where we did see an increase that was very noticeable was in the zone five area. Uh, during this time, we noticed that was occurring around Grady Hospital, where you all saw on the news a fight that broke out between family members that came uh, to the hospital from DeKalb County and, uh, that engaged in gunfire. Two arrest warrants have been issued in that homicide. One arrest has been made. Uh, we also saw three incidents right around Woodruff Park that goes back to the trend that you'll see in just a moment where anger and a weapon is leading to homicides. And that is going to be the number one driver in, in our city. But we have seen from the first quarter of this year to the second quarter reduction, uh, when generally you would historically see those numbers rise in second and third quarter, we're very uh, happy and encouraged by that number at that location. How is homicides being committed and where in our city? You'll see there that by far 76 
of the homicides that have occurred this year were with a handgun. Uh, knife being second and then blood force uh, after that. It continues to be a focus of this department to, to go after gangs, guns, and drugs because gangs, guns, and drugs are the drivers of violent crime in our city. Uh, the areas that, that the, the homicides are occurring is in our apartment complexes as well as our city streets. That's why you see the focus of education in our apartment complexes, new assistance properties, uh, meeting with those, and many of those have come through your council offices for our assistance in educating around smart property management protocols. Our crime prevention inspectors are going out to these locations to educate around lighting, camera systems, hiring of security guards, the repairing of gates, and ensuring that we're in that space as well. What you will see as a notable reduction on this list, if you recall last year, is the small number of homicides that are occurring at our clubs and our nightlife. Uh, that goes back to a focus of field operations, being heavily involved in those areas, particularly around the time that the clubs dismiss our license and permit unit at work in this area, uh, as well as uh, work by the Nightlife Commission and all focusing around that. And I do want to commend the solicitor's office, one of the most effective tools that we have now, holding individuals accountable for their conduct that contribute to homicides and violence in the city is the city solicitor's office. They're using the power of that court as well as the power of the superior court to shut down businesses that are generating environments that lead to violence in our city. And so I want to commend them for their efforts in that area. I spoke to this one, uh, members of the committee, uh, which was the fact that the number one motivator uh, in our city for a homicide and also many of the aggravated assaults that you saw on slide number three is a moment of anger. And it's a moment of anger that is accompanied by a handgun uh, or a rifle. Uh, and then we have a tragic outcome in our city. This is the one that is most difficult for this department to tackle because we can't be at every moment that there's going to be that split second of anger. So my appeal is to the person next to the person with a handgun that is in an angry moment, that is at a moment where they are upset, and then it is used to tragic events, that everyone has an obligation. If they see a, a, a moment uh, spiraling out of control, individuals getting angry, to have that person walk away, to come back at another time to address it, to put the gun down. If we're in that space, we're going to address it, and it has been shown time and time again, but we cannot be in every space. We couldn't certainly be in 32 spaces this year. Where your police department is engaged and working is the next area, is robbery, revenge, narcotics. Uh, revenge will be around generally a gang dispute, uh, and that's why you see this department turning its focus more diligently this year on gangs. Robbery, that is why you see us working very hard uh, to arrest individuals that have committed robbery and are committing robbery because a robbery is one moment away from a potential homicide occurring and that is where we would expect you to call your police department into being accountable uh, and to work in this area. Uh, you, you see there our clearance rate at the end of that quarter uh, that we're reporting out on is 62%. That's against a national average of 54%. Uh, percent. And I do want to commend our homicide unit that is out working diligently every day uh, to bring about closure for the family members of this city, family members of visitors to our city that have lost a loved one in a moment of violence. Their work continues around the clock. Uh, many of those successes are because of the uh, technology infrastructure that this body and the administration uh, has backed. Many of those uh, solves and wins are because of community trust. The police department, and we want to continue to invest in that trust so individuals do speak to our uh, homicide investigators and are willing to continue uh, to assist us in that area. The gangs, guns, and drug focus, I want to uh, focus on this one real quick. Uh, as we work to, to increase the size of the police department to its authorized force, I think it's always important to remember we remain the largest law enforcement agency in the state, and it's important that we leverage our size and expertise in that area. Uh, we have been working closely with the district attorney's office to com combat the gangs in the city, uh, most recently working very uh, closely with the YSL indictments, much of that which was coordinated out of public safety headquarters. It's important to note this statistic. The week after this indictment, we saw crime in the city of Atlanta drop 17% after the individuals started being arrested because of this indictment, where the leadership of YSL was targeted, where it had been shown that a, multi a variety of crimes, not just homicide, but a variety of crimes were being perpetrated in the city because of this structure. We're going to continue that. We have the largest number of investigators working in this city that work for any law enforcement agency, over 200. By the end of the summer, all 200 will be trained to recognize the gang statute and to bring the gang statute. So if we detect at the burglary level that a gang is in 
involved, that is where we will apply the gang statute, not, not send it up to the gang unit to make that charge at a later date. If we see it at work in car break-ins, which we do see it, uh, and motor vehicle thefts, where we do see it, we will bring the charge at that moment to ensure that the district attorney has what she needs to be able to focus on that area. And I think if you notice on there year to date, we have uh, made 48 arrests uh, in our gang, uh, focusing on gang members with 102 gang charges uh, that have been brought. And that is compared to 69 gang charges that were brought last year by the Atlanta Police Department. So I think you were speaking to the efforts of our men and women uh, that are working today to focus on that area. Gun recoveries continues to be a priority of the police department. That is currently now trending up 11% over last year. Uh, it has increased in every zone with exception of zone 5, which right now is seeing a slight increase over where it was last year. How are we getting these guns? Uh, we are getting these guns through focused narcotics effort. We are, we are retrieving these guns through traffic stops. If you are driving through a convenience store, and I mentioned it before, but I think it's very important to mention, you see a canine uh, dog out uh, at the uh, location, uh, wherever it may be, and this is where the, the, the concerns from your district office is important to us because when we do receive complaints that there's a gas station, there's a business that we believe is contributing to crime in your district, you will see our canine officers there uh, running their dogs around the gas pumps, uh, the, uh, the, the ice machine. We often get consent to go inside and we remove guns from behind uh, candy bars in the cooler, areas that's been stashed to protect a drug trade that is operating out of there because a drug trade in your district is a ticking time bomb for violence. And that is where we're, we're recovering those. And then uh, just a variety of arrests that officers make uh, each and every day of individuals with a proclivity to victimize individuals that reside or work in your area. I want to mention narcotics real quick. Uh, this particular slide was taken from uh, 1965 Rambling Lane uh, in the Brookside of Apartments. We had actually had a member who resides in that apartment club complex reach out to us. He said, I think uh, I've got someone that I live close to that is uh, maybe dealing drugs. And so this department goes to work, and this is the outcome of that investigation. They were dealing a large amount of drugs uh, that you can see there in the cash of their proceeds. What you will invariably see with every narcotics operation this department shuts down is the amount of firearms that is right at the top of that photograph. A rifle and four handguns. The reason it is there, when you have a lucrative business such as this, someone will invariably come to take the drugs you see there, will invariably come to knock out the competition. And it's incumbent on this department to be engaged in those spaces for the citizens so violence never comes through Rambling Lane or that apartment complex. And we shut it down first, we take the guns, we take the, the drugs before they harm the citizens and they contribute it back to the slide where we said narcotics was at play in this homicide, this is our ability to ensure uh, homicide is never connected to that neighborhood or narcotics. I'm gonna this is dangerous work, and I want to commend the men and women that build these warrants that see you see on the screen, that seize those guns. And if you had seen the body-worn camera of this entry team in the apartment when they breached the door, you could see the individuals inside with guns in their hands. And the restraint of the department to be able to still facilitate that warrant, take all those individuals into custody, and remove that drug operation is commendable. But it's something that occurs every day, and it doesn't get the news because it's just what we do, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm proud of our narcotics investigators that do this work. Repeat offenders, uh, we report out this quarterly uh, before this body. It is a concern of ours. Uh, it is very detrimental to morale that we continue to arrest the same individuals for very serious crimes on over and over. Remember, to become a repeat offender, uh, you have to be convicted of a felony multiple times. This is not an easy bar to achieve. Uh, and what I want to point your attention to, that of the 423 repeat career offenders that we've arrested this year, 26% of them were armed at the time we rearrested them. Whether they were breaking their cars, dealing drugs, committing a burglary, uh, they were armed at the time. So they could not have those weapons because they were convicted felons multiple times over. Uh, and they also were engaged in activity that could easily uh, impact the livability of your neighborhoods and your districts that you represent. So this is an area we continue to work on. We want to thank uh, the administration for their focus on uh, repeat violent offenders as well as the district attorney for their work in that area also. This is, and I'm getting close to the end, but this is a picture that I hope you're seeing more and more in your city. Uh, this is a street racer that was active in the, in the zone two area of our city. 
Uh, we received a number of, com we started seeing a re-emergence of this uh, crime in the city, and we have uh, allocated more resources to this area. We've also designated our response to this location. Uh, now all street racing calls are designated a priority two, which means they are immediately broadcast over the air. Uh, there's immediate response, including supervisors to those calls, and therefore we have, from the time the call is placed until it is being dispatched, has now been reduced to 41 seconds uh, to be able to get that out. This weekend on 14th Street, uh, the captain, who's the night commander uh, overseeing city operations, he made the arrest uh, when he was responding to the citizens' 911 call and arrived to see a person doing donuts right there in the parking lot, Councilmember Boone. Uh, he was able to move in, block him in, and take him into custody. Individual had a gun on him, was wanted out of the state of Texas for a weapons offense. They won't extradite, uh, but he was arrested and, and cited for those offense. And then this weekend, we had three other individuals that were arrested for uh, street racing that started in the northern end of the city, moved into DeKalb, and that was done through the 911's quick dispatch, uh, the assistance of, of the Georgia State Patrol, as well as our air unit in that area. Going to move now to the hiring and attrition of within the police department. As you know, we continue to uh, move toward our authorized strength of the police department. Uh, we, we do that through an aggressive hiring program, but it's going to also be about retention. If we are doing 10 things to grow back the Atlanta Police Department, six of them have to be about retention. Uh, year to date, we have hired 103 individuals. That is over 39 that were hired at this point this year. Uh, and then our attrition right now is 86 with the breakdown there of those that have retired for normal retirements. That would be expected, uh, those that are moving on to the other areas. We are focusing heavily uh, on the attrition area uh, because we want to make sure we have uh, smart attrition uh, and retention uh, tactics that we're able to retain people uh, that are leaving to go to other agencies, which is our focus. Some are deciding to leave the profession. There's a variety of family reasons that arrive well, so we want to be smart how we're uh, attacking that area. Uh, our successful at the end of the uh, second quarter, we had 141 recruits in the Atlanta Police Department. That's probably the highest that I can remember since I've been in following these numbers. Uh, 96 of those are in training. Uh, that includes field training and three classes in. We have 45 that's in class zero, and their class is slated to start this month. Uh, so we'll have that number in there as they can move through their 35-week training program. Uh, then we will be assigning them to the precincts uh, throughout the city and also being able to do some backfill to specialized units that is important to the success of the department. Just a couple of things I want to note there uh, is the rehires. We've had uh, five individuals return to the police department. Uh, all last year there was four. So we're, we're approaching the halfway point. We are aggressively talking to individuals that are reaching out to us, uh, seeking ways to, to come back to the police department. Uh, and then the laterals that we brought into the police department. We've, we've welcomed people from the Woodstock Police Department, Detroit, Indianapolis, uh, East Point, College Park, and we're glad they're joining us. We are the most diverse police department in the state, uh, both in the men and women that fill the ranks as well as the assignments that you can work in. So if you are a person that cares about your community, we want you to consider the Atlanta Police Department. Uh, we want you to come here because we're the best way to make a difference in this city. And we're, we're, we're uh, proud of the progressive manner in which we provide for the safety and the security of these neighborhoods. And we want anyone that is here to join us. We encourage you to live in the city. Um, and we, we're excited about this. Uh, retention is key. Uh, this is why we're working. The administration has did the targeted retention Retention bonuses for our officers, that is vital, the COLA uh, that, uh, that you all support as well as retention bonuses, the new facilities. Uh, we're proud that the Zone 4 precinct uh, to be replaced by the bond referendum. Thank you to every citizen that voted yes, yes, and yes. Uh, that is exciting. This is how we keep members of our department. And the new training center that is coming, uh, the men and women of the police department do not mind to do the dangerous and the demanding, but they just want to have the tools and the equipment to do it. Uh, so we're thankful for that. I'm going to close on this note before we take questions. And it's not advancing. I'm going to go on to the next slide. Is is following up on our uh, oh, keep Atlanta safe. We want to continue to promote Connect Atlanta. Uh, this is growing. We've we've had 900 cameras added in quarter two. So we ask you to please continue to promote that in your district and citywide. This is how the 21st Century Neighborhood Watch works. And so having uh, access to business cameras and knowing you've registered to say, I will share if there's been a crime on my block. That is important to what we do. And then just thank you to our pal. I've seen many of you at the midnight basketball events that's coming out. That is the way to fight crime. So we never see a crime report that we have to present to you. 
We have over 125 youth uh, that are in our summer camps from ages 8 to 17. We have 25 team counselors from ages 14 to 18 uh, that are working at our centers. Thank you to the mayor's uh, summer employment program allowed us to be able to do that. Uh, and then, of course, the midnight basketball. And just thanks to our, our PAL unit uh, that is working really long hours to be at two centers, Roselle Femme and C.T. Martin, to ensure that we have the events going on there. Uh, and we appreciate our officers that are working very long hours to ensure a safe summer as part of our summer plan. And then finally, before I open up for questions, this past Saturday, we had six neighborhoods uh, that were represented at Public Safety Headquarters for training for Neighborhood Watch. And I have to give a shout out to Collier Heights. Collier Heights was the largest there in number. Uh, they were uh, very organized. That They were there for the renewal, uh, I believe, because they were continuing their certification. And they actually uh, offered to go to the other neighborhoods to help them get their neighborhood watch starting. So uh, I will be back in another quarter. We will have had another uh, neighborhood watch training. So I want to brag on other neighborhoods in your district. Uh, so if, if you could please uh, help people sign up for neighborhood watch. We, that is the important partnership that we have. And we look forward to having more neighborhoods in our neighborhood watch training in quarter three uh, of 2022. Uh, Chairperson Hillis, that's the report out from the Atlanta Police Department, available for any questions that you or members of the committee may have. Thank you, and I'm Chief Sherbaum. First is just a comment um, on the Help Keep Atlanta Safe, the Connect Atlanta plan. I uh, just wanted to say I, I've looked, and uh, we're up to now 3862, so an additional 200. I just wanted to announce that I was a part of those numbers. I signed uh, my cameras up at home, uh, and also my wife signed her camera's up at her business. Um, so also wanted to stress to people that uh, have seen this that this is not, does not allow immediately APD to access your cameras freely. Uh, what it does is it, if there is a crime uh, in your vicinity, you get an email from APD uh, asking you to review those cameras. Um, and I'm sure the chief can speak a little more eloquently about that, but I wanted to uh, really drive that home. And this really does help uh, APD investigate and uh, and, and reduce crime in, in our neighborhoods. That's correct. There's a distinction between registering your cameras and integrating your cameras. Uh, we do encourage, if you're a business with exterior cameras, to uh, integrate them. That allows us at any time to look at those cameras as we respond to a call, as we're investigating a crime that may have occurred. Uh, it's been very effective throughout the city. But the other one that we have the, the significant ask for is just to register your cameras. And so what will happen if there's a package theft on your, on your street, uh, if someone has gone missing on your street, uh, we will send you an email response and say, I'm investigator so-and-so from the Atlanta Police Department. This is what we're investigating. Do you mind to look at your cameras during this time? Do you have something that may be of value to our department? And the, 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 the net is an exchange. Those individuals respond back, and we're able to see if they have footage that is beneficial. You only have to look to our social media to see where that has been beneficial uh, through, throughout the city. So for those that continue to do it, it's just yet another way for everybody to have a role in the safety of all 242 of the neighborhoods that comprise. Our, uh, our city. Thank you, Chief. Uh, going back, we've got two more questions. One is about recruitment. I know we have the recruitment events uh, here in the city. Uh, however, it's been 15 years, but I was once a, uh, before I changed to nursing, was a criminal justice student. So what are we doing to outreach uh, to colleges and universities, uh, be it here locally or in the southeast, uh, to recruit uh, criminal justice students to come? join APD once they graduate. We're seeking the ability to be involved in every job fair that uh, institutions may have where we could be present. Uh, we are engaging those organizations right right here in the, in the city of Atlanta, uh, whether it's at Georgia State University or Atlanta Metropolitan State College, which is graciously hosting us right now uh, for our training center. Uh, we are also focused on, on the military. Uh, as well as lateral programs. Individuals that are very proven. I have a heart for service. Uh, I'm a capable, competent, constitutional, and compassionate police officer. Uh, that is where our focus is as well to bring them onto the police department. Thank you. And lastly, on the one of the second quarter report slides about the method and location of our homicides. The highest, as you mentioned, is our apartment complexes. Um, can do you have it on you, or can you look into the distinction between how many of those 26 are inside of the apartments versus outside in open air? We do. We track that. Uh, 
uh, council member. So we can provide that at some point, but it's something we look at because it changes our tactics. Uh, we can't be present, nor should we be in every apartment, uh, but we certainly have the ability to influence uh, the management to, to police their outdoor spaces and where that's uh, available. Some of those, the argument may have started inside uh, and the action may have occurred outside, but we look closely where our gatherings on the property potentially leading to these, uh, these occurrences. Thank you, Chief. Next is Council Member Waits. Okay. It's, oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chief, thank you for everything that you do. During the roundtable this morning regarding human trafficking, one of the recommendations from uh, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis was that we increase the time frame that we hold camera, the footage from the cameras. Uh, it's my understanding there's currently 45 days and she indicated that if we could increase that footage that we hold uh, with respect to high traffic areas or historical patterns uh, where individuals may be trafficking and I'm referring to places like the airport. And I'm wondering is that a legislative piece or is that something that you can do administratively from your end and secondly, I noticed during your presentation that a large number of the crimes are theft from motor vehicles. That seems to be the largest trend. And I wanted to know if you discovered some patterns and trends uh, and any thoughts regarding collaboration with other agencies and possibly a communication to businesses and corporations uh, to uh, warned or to give some type of guidance to patrons to not leave anything on their seat to possibly cut down on this particular trend. Yes, sir, to answer your first question, I'll determine for you uh, what our curtain hold status is, because those cameras are going to be those that we own as a city. Uh, the, the airport, we would obviously uh, confer with them. Uh, the difference, some of it could be an administrative change. Uh, many times we find that there's an expense uh, to storing the data, and so we would have to look to determine, is it a, a policy change or is it an expense that would require uh, some type of funding to expand uh, the ability to do that. We always want to be striving for best practices, so where we can do our part to ensure that we're combating human trafficking outside of our participation on federal uh, task forces as well as our work in the gang unit. As you probably learned today, there's a nexus between gangs and human trafficking. And so this department, uh, as it increases its capability to, to combat gangs, know that we're combating human trafficking when we do so. On the second one, you know, I've been on the Atlanta Police Department for 20 years. Uh, I believe in year one, car break-ins were number one. And I believe it's been number one for the 20th years. And as we see our department, our city grow, uh, we're going to continue to see where we need the help of the citizens. To answer your point, ma'am, we currently have a summer initiative underway that's five-fold right now to combat that trend. Uh, one of those prongs is actually engaging property management to do their part for car break-ins. Uh, because as we see areas grow, particularly in West Midtown, Midtown, uh, when you start seeing parking decks replace parking lots, that is a challenge for us. Uh, because we are able to drive through through a parking lot as part of our routine patrols. Uh, we are able to sit in parking lots to do police reports. But what we can't do, nor should we be doing, is patrolling private property parking decks. Uh, if you are generating revenue uh, off individuals that are living in your building or going to your businesses, then we ask you to invest in security guards, cameras, lighting. Do not allow individuals to go in and out on a five-minute pass or a ten-minute pass. If you go in, you pay and you geofence your properties so scooters cannot be allowed on the properties. Those things being done, you will see a sharp reduction of car break-ins in that particular property. And then, yes, if you uh, a clean car campaign, if there's nothing in the car, uh, there's nothing being stolen. Now, some people will still break a window to try to get her to look, but it greatly reduces those occurrences. Currently, the department is tracking 90 individuals out of almost four, or a little over 400 who are on some level of supervised release for car break-ins. It's a little over 400. Uh, and we're looking at 90 that we have a high propensity. We're actually engaging with their probation officers them. We are actively serving warrants for individuals that we have sworn out arrest warrants for breaking into cars. Uh, and so far this year, we have arrested a number of those individuals uh, that are breaking into cars. So we will continue to be there as this city grows, as this city booms, and you see our neighborhoods growing, car break-ins, is something we want to educate around uh, and we want to ask the court to be meaningful around. If we place this individual before you for the third, the fourth time, uh, there's probably a proclivity of them to make people feel unsafe in our city because their car has been broken into uh, and use the wisdom of the courtroom to be able to assist that person or address the issues of why uh, we're breaking into cars. But it is our priority, ma'am, uh, because it's, it, you see the volume that's there uh, and so that is a police responsibility for us to do our part, but our part also to educate individuals of what you can do uh, to 
to make your parking deck safe and your parking lot safe. Next is Council Member Andre Boone. Thank you, Chief. Just wanting to let you know that we have seen a great improvement um, from 3657 ML King Jr. Drive all the way up to the Lynnhurst Drive um, corridor. Also, Majors Jackson and Mormon have doing have been doing a really, really good job working together with the Gordon Plaza. Um, business Association and um, Lawrence Way um, there was a specific incident that was handled really really well over the weekend so we would like to thank Major Jackson for handling that well thank you thank you ma'am we will pass that along Councilman River Street same I just want to um, just give a quick Shout out to Major Jackson also. Um, his communication has been very good. Um, and I, I definitely want to make sure that when someone's doing something right, I acknowledge that also, not just when I get frustrated. Um, and um, I just do, I, I appreciate that. And your presentation today was, you know, chock full of, of stats. And that's what we need. You know, everything that we do should be data driven um, and not just. Um, fly by night and I really appreciate the work that you all are putting in um, also it does seem to me too that the judicial system is coming around um, lately in the news looks like um, they don't like the stats either when these repeat uh, offenders are are constantly being arrested 10 20 30 times um, it doesn't look good for anyone, not for the city, not for the judicial system. It, it makes it look as if we're all on a merry-go-round. And um, so, you know, thank you for, you know, staying data-driven, um, coming before us with all of this information, good or bad. Um, and again, thank you to um, Major Jackson for what he's done in these, few, these last few months. He's really been communicating well. Thank you, Chief. Thank you all. Next up, we will have Atlanta Fire Rescue Department's quarterly update. Chief Smith, welcome. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Hillis, Council Members Boone, Overstreet, Waits, and last but not least, uh, Council Member Norwood, who's joining us from home. It's my pleasure to be here today to present to you on behalf of the men and women of the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department of the fourth quarter presentation uh, for fiscal year 2022. Our goals and objectives as a department are to ensure that our uh, engines are fully staffed, to ensure that we maintain uh, pay equitability, uh, continue uh, to complete our enhancements, repairs and replacements of our fleet and facilities as well as ensure that we have a safe working environment and we also will continue our comprehensive hiring and recruitment plan as it relates to our relationship with you as well as the city council our goal is to ensure that we are providing adequate compensation rates to our employees uh, continue to review ems services that are provided to the city as well as reviewing our facility and our fleet conditions Our organizational priorities are uh, service excellence, uh, staffing strategies, as well as fleet and facility enhancements and construction. When we look at our service uh, excellence, we look at our metrics for uh, this quarter, and what you will see is that there is uh, a consistency with our increases that come with the weather changes as well as school being out. However, if you look to the right, you will see that uh, quarter over quarter comparison between the fourth quarter, you will see the downtown numbers are going down. Those numbers are going down because we uh, recently did a review of our uh, calls for service strategy and we changed some of the calls to ensure that the calls we were going to were actually and truly the calls that we were actually needed on. And so our goal is to increase the availability of the equipment as we respond across the city. Uh, you will see that the numbers for the airport are uh, 
continuing to go up uh, as well as over the uh, quarter of uh, quarter uh, four. And you will see hopefully that we anticipate addressing that through the opening of the clinic at the airport here in the next couple of months. Our inspection numbers are consistent with where we are, uh, which they typically are around uh, the lower to mid 400s, uh, totaling 1,202 uh, for that uh, quarter. As we continue with our staffing uh, strategies and addressing those challenges, you will see that in the fourth quarter, we had uh, five members sworn to retire as well as 15 to resign with one termination. Our civilian numbers, which are on the next slide, uh, represent uh, zero, uh, excuse me, zero retired, five resignations and two terminations. Uh, our vacancy rate is now down to 12.16% and we continue our evergreen hiring process and we currently have a sworn vacancy of 144 uh, out of our authorized strength of 1184. We have approximately 113 recruits that are currently in training and we will continue our efforts to continue to hire and fill our vacancies. And these are our civilian numbers. When we look at uh, the 113 recruit classes that we have, you'll see that the first class, which is 2102A, uh, they just recently graduated from recruit school on the 21st of June. Uh, you will see that we have uh, a host of graduations that are up and coming, uh, with the next one being uh, the next group, 21.2B. Uh, uh, they're scheduled to graduate on September 13th. Uh, 2201 is scheduled to graduate on December 6th. Uh, 21, excuse me, 222 uh, is scheduled to graduate in February of 23 and 223 is scheduled to graduate in June of 13. So as you can see, we are very busy uh, with making sure that we have uh, qualified people to fill uh, our vacancies in our positions. Our third priority is uh, facilities and fleet, in which we will continue to address uh, the challenges that have been plaguing us as it relates to maintaining our fleet as well as our facilities you will see that we have some significant strides moving forward with uh, replacing equipment and adding equipment to our fleet. You will see the initial GMA, uh, the initial GMA uh, requirement for us was given to us and we have begun that procurement process uh, to get the initial engine as well as the initial ladder. Uh, we recently had a pre-con construction meeting on site that was completed uh, during this fiscal year. And so we're moving forward aggressively with that purchase. Uh, the GMA additions that were added, which will allow us to get the additional three engines and three ladders, uh, we're kind of currently in the funding process uh, with fiscal to make those purchases. And we anticipate that those engines, based on their non-customization or basic uh, status, we should be receiving those first three initial engines before the end of this year. Uh, the pickup trucks are currently having the lights being installed. Those will be our rapid response units. We anticipate having those in service for the end of the year as well. And we are proceeding with all vehicle purchases for uh, downtown as well as the airport. The airport is slated to replace three of its uh, aircraft rescue uh, vehicles. Uh, we're anticipating the pre-construction meeting for those purchases or those additions uh, to be in August or September of this year. We are replacing the mini pumper uh, at the airport. Uh, the contract has been awarded to a vendor as well as we are replacing community risk reduction vehicles that are located at the airport. Next, you will see a list of facilities that we currently have uh, work going on. We are very busy with doing renovations as well as have uh, some new construction. Uh, the structural repairs and ADA uh, upgrades for Station 8 was recently completed. Uh, Station 12 is slated to begin uh, its work in October of this year. Uh, Station 19, uh, we are awaiting uh, the windows 
uh, for that project to be completed, and we're anticipating that those will be here uh, in August of well, as well. And so we're looking to have that hopefully completed before uh, the end of August, excuse me, for 19. Uh, Station 22, we recently, uh, through DEAM, got a new vendor. I believe that vendor is uh, Johnson Lux uh, doing the construction, and we have been getting a, given a tentative uh, completion date of December of 23. Uh, Fire Station 36, as well as EMS Station 37, are well on their way. Um, we had a couple of setbacks. I'm sure you saw on, on the news that we had some supplies that were stolen, some copper that was stolen from both of those work sites. And so we're working to secure that and working with the vendors. Uh, but the setback should only put us uh, approximately 30 days behind. Uh, we're looking to open the EMS station at Hartsfield-Jackson in the main atrium uh, in fall of this year, as well as the procurement of the connex boxes or the temporary burn structure that we are putting into place at Clare Drive, and we're looking to have that up and operational by December of this year to assist with training our recruits. And next you will see uh, the accomplishments thus far uh, for fiscal year 22. We have successfully graduated 55 recruits. Uh, throughout the course of the fiscal year, I believe we have hired upwards of 190 people um, as fire recruits. Uh, we recently had our 75th firefighter memorial service. Uh, we are excited to announce that the promotional exam for the lieutenants and captains are scheduled for this weekend. Uh, we have not had one of those tests in a very long time, so we're looking forward to getting that test completed and getting some people promoted and up through the ranks. Uh, as well as we just recently submitted our uh, reaccreditation compliance report uh, to SIPSI to ensure that our, com our accreditation is maintained for the department. And we are happy uh, to share with you about our cadet program and the recent uh, signing uh, during this quarter of our uh, cadets, uh, which we did conditional job offers for them to come on to the fire department upon graduation. And they have uh, a total of four of them, and they have all uh, begun the background pro process to become firefighters, firefighters, excuse me, for the city of Atlanta. And that concludes my presentation, and I am happy and here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chief. Um, first question I have is on your slide, I think it's seven, on your vacancy rate of 12.16%, are you including the 113 recruits in your calculation of that number? Yes, sir. Um, I would like that without the recruits included. Okay. Uh, given the recruits are force recruits and in training and aren't out staffing our fire stations and fire trucks and responding to emergencies. Uh, okay. I'd like to see what that number is uh, with them taken out. Okay. We'll uh, break you it out. Provide us that. Um, another one, which uh, I've asked about before, if I could just get. Um, a clearer kind of understanding as where we are in that additional fire equipment for downtown. Okay. Uh, that was it was spelled out uh, in the resolution uh, that was passed last term um, because that included quite a bit of equipment, as you know. Yes, sir. Um, over yes. two fiscal years, and we're already through one of those fiscal years. Uh, but I'm not seeing what that resolution called for uh, being procured already. I get some more information on that. And then saving the best for last just on these facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I'm probably preaching to the choir. I know you don't control this. This is DEEM mm -hmm. um, procurement. But it's, you know, using the one I'm most familiar with because it's in District 9, Station 22. I'm actually hopefully going to make a meeting after this where we're asking, I'd already asked for $1 million more million to fill the gap when we authorized this a few years ago before it was abandoned by a contractor who I hope the city never does business with again. But now we're going back to our tax allocation district and we are asking for another $5 million dollars to spend $16 million to build a fire station. And I'm sure you know 
Sandy Springs, DeKalb County are building stations larger than the one at 22, a three-bay station, with more amenities for five, you know, y'all know this, five to seven and a half million dollars. We don't need to do this anymore. And just going forward, we have put, none of them are in my district, but just advocating for the city as a whole in my role as the chair, we're spending, we have allocated $53 million in the renewed 2.0 Atlanta bond to build four fire stations. When if we were spending and hiring the contractors that are doing the ones in Sandy Springs and DeKalb, which are again larger uh, with more amenities than we have, um, including amenities that will eliminate uh, carcinogens from fire equipment, we could build anywhere from seven to ten stations. So again, I know this is not all on your, your arms and you're probably as frustrated as I am because we need many, many fire stations built. 22, the one they're in now, built in 1938. So I would appreciate you just working uh, as I have been with the administration, with DEAM, with procurement, and cleaning up this nonsense. It is ridiculous that we're spending $60 million to build one three-bay fire station when other uh, governments around us are spending a third of that amount. Will do. And I will defer to my colleagues now, Council Member Overstreet. Thank you, Chief Smith. Um, I, I really want to um, thank you, first of all, for your presentation, as always. Um, it, it's plenty of information in here that we do need. Um, and, you know, I, I know I'm super biased. I, I know I am. Uh, but just seeing that these stations really are progressing in district... In, in Southwest Atlanta, um, Station 36 with Princeton Lakes Fire Station, you know, that has been a labor of love for a long, long, long time. Uh, Princeton Lakes has been up and running for a while, and that was in their tad a long time ago. Um, and now they're finally going to get it. And um, and this pilot program, the EMS, at, at Station 37, um, every time I see uh, updates, I get really excited because when I'm talking to people and I'm letting them know that we'll see that actualize within a year, um, they're, they're in disbelief because it went from nothing to it's happening. Right. Um, so I just, I do want to, you know, give you all thanks when it's due. Um, I, I can definitely understand my colleague's frustration though. Um, you know, it, it, it has to be frustrating. I, I do understand that. I remember sitting in, in several meetings with him when we were talking about all of the fire stations. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it is frustrating when, when our, our plans don't go as planned. Um, but I do want you to know that I appreciate what is going right. I also um, am happy to hear about all of these classes. As you were saying them, I was writing down the dates, the months that you were mentioning. And it really is impressive that I think that now people are interested in, in joining our force. And um, they should be because we as a city are trying to, you know, do the right thing by um, incentives and, and salary to make sure that we're being fair and also factor in, you know, the housing that we're working on, you know, as a city, making sure they can actually live in Atlanta. Um, I just think that all of it adds up uh, over time. You know, we're coming from such a deep deficit that it's hard to, you know, celebrate the small wins. Um, but I can see it shaping up. And I, I do want you to know that, that I can really see where we're going. And eventually, I think that we're going to all be able to look back as we climb out of where we are and say, it took 15 things to get this done, but we all stuck to it. Stuck to it. And so, um, yeah, I just, I really thank you for that. I'm, I'm looking for the page where I was writing it. Um, you know, it's, it's like every other month. And, you know, one of these classes, you had to break up A and B. So, I mean, that's impressive. And so thank you for your determination there um, and your guidance. And um, that's about it for me. Thank oh, you, wait a minute. Just one, one second. Well, no, that's it. I'm going to leave it. Yeah, I'm going to stay with that. Thank okay. you.
Next is Councilmember Boone. Chief, just wanting to um, let the public know that at a minute's notice, your department went out to one of our apartment complexes where seniors were in, dis in distress over the heat, and they were able to deliver upwards to 50 fans to some of the folks that were really, really having health issues. So we appreciate that and the support that you all have given to the Midnight Basketball League um, has not gone unnoticed and all of the events around the city um, that have supported our seniors and those that needed assistance, including replacing batteries um, for our smoke detectors. Again, thank you so much for your team always being on the case and responding to the citizens of Atlanta. Thank you so much. Also, I want to acknowledge him. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by him. Council Member Bond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chief, for your presentation. I also want to thank you for the weekly commitment we have with your recruits on the HelloFresh effort. Uh, we probably distribute in person anywhere to 300, sometimes up to 800 boxes of food. And having young recruits make the difference when you're loading all those boxes. So they've been there every week, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, but I, I'm pleased to see the progress that you have placed in your report around the recruit classes. But I'd like to ask you to expound on your Swift Water Rescue Unit. I know as uh, plans for uh, the uh, park from the old Chattahoochee Brick Company, Atlanta will have access to a waterfront park along the Chattahoochee and as that develops I'd be interested in hearing how our swift water rescue unit can be improved or expanded upon. Definitely and so we're looking to expand into that area as well they're working on the response plan right now and so before that comes to fruition we will definitely be able to share that plan with you. Most of the Atlantans don't even know we have a swift water rescue operation can you just expound on what it is and right so our swift water team is a group of firefighters that are assigned to fire station 11 and they are trained in some instances to dive but they also do swift water rescues they have boats and equipment that are assigned to the station as well and they respond typically to the chattahoochee um, and we work in conjunction a lot of times with cobb county and so we're looking to expand that uh, dynamic as well as put additional and state-of-the-art equipment in that space uh, to meet those needs going into the future. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And just to quickly expound on Councilmember Vaughn's point, not only the Chattahoochee Brick, 75 acres, which will, of course, take some time to plan and get activated, but uh, the Trust for Public Land is going to be uh, constructing what they call a paddle trail in which the uh, the northernmost put in point will be where the Beach Street Creek meets the, the Chattahoochee River right at uh, the RM Clayton plant and I believe they want to have that up and running within the next year year and a half so we'll be hopefully ready. we can uh, uh, get, get a closer access I mean I know we have uh, good cooperation with Cobb County they have a swift water rescue team as well but it would be great to see something closer to the Chattahoochee right. Councilman Boyd Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to echo the sentiments of Councilmember Boone. Um, over the, I guess a few weeks ago, the 14th Street building, the AC was out, and uh, there were a number of seniors that were impacted by that, and I know uh, the fire department was very instrumental in providing water and services, and so just wanted to echo, uh, echo her sentiments, and thank you for everything you do. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments for the Chief? All right. Thank you so much, Chief Smith. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to our consent agenda, starting with our claims for favorable recommendations. I'll make a motion to accept all favorable claims. Items one and two. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Boone. Please prepare that vote. The vote is up. Okay. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. Those two items are favorable. Before moving on to our um, 
unfavorable claims. I would like to take item number 10 separately, because I'm going to ask for that to be held so I can get some further clarity from the law department. That's item number 10, 22R3997. So we'll consider that one separately and hold it. Uh, but I will make a motion to adverse all unfavorable claims, items 3 through 23, with the exception of number 10. Is there a second? Second to. Second by Councilmember Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. Please vote. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. Those items are adverse. On 22R3997, I'll make a motion to hold that item. Second. Second by Councilmember Boone. The vote is open. The vote is closed. That is five yeas, zero nays. That item is held. And Ms. Robinson, if uh, you or someone else on law will reach out to my office to schedule a meeting about that, I would appreciate it. Moving on to our regular agenda, ordinances for second reading, item number 122-0-1534. An ordinance by a Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to waive Article 10 of the Real Estate and Procurement Code contained in the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances in order to pay for continued professional services to be rendered during Renewal Number 2, term retroactive effective June 3, 2022, through June 2, 2023 of the Professional Services Agreement, SPS 120187, Emergency Medical Director Services with Mark Waterman, MD, on behalf of the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department in an amount not to exceed $55,992.00 and for other purposes. I will make a motion to approve this item. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is favorable. Item number two, 22-0-1548. An ordinance by Councilmember Dustin Hillis to waive the provisions of Chapter 10, Article 2, Section 10-09 CND of the Code of, of Ordinances of the City of Atlanta, Georgia, so as to modify the hours of operation on Monday, September 5th, 2022 Labor Day, only for all licensed establishments authorized to sell alcoholic beverages for on-premises consumption and for the purposes. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Boone. Councilmember Waits. Uh, well, first, Councilmember Waits uh, will make an amendment. I'll make a motion to amend to add Councilmember Waits to that legislation. Anyone else? Boone. Anyone else on the committee? Councilmember Overstreet. Juan, would you like to be added to yeah. further celebrate Labor Day? <laughs> but I believe that's all of us. So who is the seconder on that amendment? Boone. Boone. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is amended. I'll make a motion to approve as amended. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is favorable as amended. Item number three. Uh, An ordinance by Councilmember Amir Faroki authorizing the ratification of services rendered by and payments made to the Atlanta Fulton County Pre-Arrest Diversion Initiative Incorporated during business as Policing Alternatives and Diversion in Initiative during the period from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022, in connection with that memorandum of understanding with PAD Incorporated, through which PAD Incorporated provides the pre-arrest diversion services throughout the city of Atlanta, 
and to authorize a mayor or his designee to exercise the second renewal option under the MOU with the term commencing July 1st, 2022 and ending June 30th, 2023. Add additional funds to the MOU using funds received by the city from the U.S. Department of Treasury under the American Rescue Plan Act in an amount not to exceed $4,500,000 and zero cents and expand the scope of services under the MOU to include additional pre-arrest diversion services eligible for and consistent with the ARPA to make any other modifications to the MOU as may be required by law due to the use of the ARPA funds and for other purposes. Mr. Chair, there was an amendment a word was removed from section one. All right, I'll make a motion for that amendment. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Overstreet. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The item is amended. Make a motion to approve as amended. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Overstreet. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is amended, or excuse me, it is favorable as amended. Moving on to item number four, resolutions 22R4011. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to exercise renewal option number one for SPS 1210109 with Judge Allison Pitts on behalf of the Municipal Court of Atlanta for a term of two years effective November 25th, 2022 through November 24th, 2024 in amount not to exceed $40,000 and zero cents. All funds shall be charged to and paid from the funding accounts listed herein and for other purposes. All right. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Waits. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is favorable. Item number 522 R4012. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to exercise renewal option number one for SPS 1200393 with Senior Judge Catherine Maliki on behalf of the Municipal Court of Atlanta for a term of two years effective September 3rd, 2022 through September 2nd, 2024 in an amount not to exceed $40,000 per year. All funds shall be charged to and paid from the funding accounts listed herein and for other purposes. Motion to approve by Council, Council Member Bon, or excuse me, Council Member Boone. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Overstreet. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is favorable. We will take items six through nine as a block. Please sign those items. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the City of Atlanta in the case of Tika Haynes versus City of Atlanta, civil action file number. 19EV002251 Fulton County State Court in the amount of $50,000 authorizing said amount to be paid from the account numbers listed herein authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the total settlement amount and for other purposes. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against defendants in the case of Breda Honeycutt 
versus City of Atlanta, Georgia, civil action number 120CV00263, TCBRGV, pending in the United States District Court, Northern District of Georgia, Atlanta Division, in the amount of $24,000.00. The settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the accounts numbers, account numbers listed, authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against defendant City of Atlanta in the case of State Farm Mutual Automobile Insurance Company as subrogate of Joseph Jacob Cardell versus City of Atlanta Civil Action File Number 21EV003741 pending in the State Court of Fulton County of Georgia in the amount of $9,000.00. The settlement amount authorizing the settlement to be charged to and from the accounts number, the account number listed herein, authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the City of Atlanta in the case of Ivan D. Roos versus City of Atlanta Civil, fi civil Action File Number 2017-CV-296216, Fulton County Superior Court, in the amount of $100,000, authorizing said amount to be paid as follows in the account number listed herein, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute the total settlement amount and for other purposes. Make a motion to approve those four items. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 68 0 nays. That item is, those four items are favorable. We'll now move to item 13 under held. Uh, we, we have a substitution. Does, that, yes. does it change the caption any? No, it does not change the caption. I go and read it in. An onus by council members Dustin Hillis, Jason Dozier, Matt Westmoreland, Jason Winston, Mary Norwood, Howard Shook, Liliana Battiari, Alex Wan, Byron D. Amos, Antonio Lewis, Andrea L. Boone, Amir Faroki, Keisha Sean Waits, and Michael Julian Bond to amend Chapter 74, Article 5, Section 74-175 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances to authorize the municipal court to order the abatement of a public nuisance established as a result of violent conduct or crime occurring with certain properties through the immediate closure of such properties to require the municipal court to order the abatement of such a public nuisance through the immediate closure of such properties where the municipal court has determined such a public nuisance to have occurred twice regarding the same property within 24 months and for other purposes. I will make a motion to bring forth the substitute. Is there a second? And the substitute just changes five of the uh, added five whereas clauses? Yes, Mr. Chair. Is there a second for that substitute? Second by Councilmember Overstreet. Please have heard the vote on the substitute. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Days zero nays. The substitute is before us. Councilmember Overstreet. First, I want to thank you for having the uh, work session last week. Um, specifically pertaining to this legislation because you know that my main concern was that it wasn't fair to all nightlife and all um, sectors of entertainment in Atlanta. We had a, a sec section of, um, of our customers, I call um, all of our um, entities that our business partners to be our customers, the city's customers. Um, and we had a whole sector of um, our customers that were not able to do the same as other uh, portions of our, our, our um, nightlife community. And so now even our um, adult entertainment 
once we pass this legislation, we'll be able to, for the first time in, in three decades, be able to also hire off-duty police officers uh, to be in the parking lots. So the blue lots, lights will be there uh, with restrictions, of course, but they have been asking for this for 30 years. So now it, it levels the playing field so that all of our nightlife uh, will be able to uh, have the same options for security um, outside and inside of their uh, establishments and they won't be um, preyed upon from uh, people knowing that they were not able to actually have sworn officers on site. So um, I would like for someone to come up and speak to this uh, from the administrative office um, so that everyone will know that we are now in a, on a level playing field for everyone. Uh, yes, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the Public Safety Committee. Uh, my name is Theo Pace, Deputy Chief of Staff for the Office of the Mayor. And just want to thank you for considering this legislation. Um, this is just another initiative of the Dickens administration to provide another tool in the toolbox for our police officers and partners to really address crime. Um, if you talk about the repeat offenders task force that's been created, uh, the establishment of a nightlife division, as well as the light up the night 10,000 lights, uh, street lights campaign, uh, the number of initiatives that the Dickens administration is putting forth to really address crime. And we'd just like to thank you all for considering this legislation again today. And I'm opening any questions that you all may have. Questions for Mr. Pace. All right, I will make a motion to approve as substituted. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Overstreet. Please prepare the vote. The vote is up there. Please vote. The vote is closed. Right. Four yeas, one nay, one abstention. That item is favorable on substitute. And I believe that uh, completes our legislative agenda. Uh, any the questions, comments, well wishes from committee members? Member Bond. Well, I had some legislation. I didn't see it on the agenda. It was about the uh, code. I had copied you and I read it in at the council meeting. About the taxi cabs. Oh, oh with the transportation. Okay, never mind. Transportation committee. Any other comments? Um, Mr. Chair, I just want to again thank you for uh, sharing your skills and life-saving measures uh, for the constituents of Atlanta. So I'm, I'm sure that came up at the beginning of the meeting, but just wanted to express my gratitude to you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, thank you on behalf of the citizens of Atlanta. You were definitely at the right time, um, at the right place at the right time. and. Um, we appreciate your skills and your talents and um, always keep your nursing certificate updated. Thank you. I worked very hard for it and I plan on doing that. So thank you. Also thank you, Mr. Ward, for calling that out in your public comments. Any other questions or comments? Right, we'll adjourn on unanimous consent of members present. Thank you. <laughs>